I do think that this is a bit of an educational problem and this is going to sound like old man yells at clouds. I apologize. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not what, it's not what you think. The curriculum revisions in schools have become increasingly what to teach mm -hmm. as individual teachers have lost more and more power and more and more agency and education has become increasingly top down. And I find it interesting, you know, the fight over curriculum is not an accident. It's been, it's been going on since, since I was in the school strikes by me started when I was just ending high school. And there, uh, my life changed when there was a really nasty strike uh, at the university I was going to and professors who I recognized from class. There was there was a day that um, I was trying to drive in because I lived off campus mm -hmm. and it was my mom's car and I was trying to drive into campus and professors who I recognized were banging on the hood of my car, screaming like like a psychotic person. <laughs> and it was so terrifying. I actually turned the car around, drove myself to the hospital for a, a what was at the time called a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. And that changed my life. That's when I started, I started looking for a new path and I got into media and I started going, I don't want to read about women who make stuff. I want to be a woman who makes stuff. And I saw Unfortunately, if uh, this is a big problem facing women and, and the ageism that's out there, if you think you're going to go to university and then go out and get a work, get work as an entertainer, you will have to wait a very, very long time as a woman because there is a gap in available parts between the age of about 24 and about 35, because you're too old to play the ingenue, you're too young to play the mom. Mm -hmm. And so you either have to start early or be prepared to wait a long time. And that is not fair because for men, there are parts straight through. There are parts for men at every age. Yeah. It is not true of women. And the other problem with women, if you are tall, you're at a disadvantage. You know, it, it, that's why the Tom Holland Zendaya thing is, is so good because I was too tall for love and trust roles because mm -hmm. most actors are only five, eight. There's a lot, there's a lot of not, not very tall, like five, eight, five, nine actors, which is average height, <laughs> but you put me in heels. I'm five, nine. Mm hmm you know, and, and you have to be shorter, you know, you have to be that head shorter than yeah. the leading man. And it, there are still issues. And I mean, that's part of the reason I think people were so combative regarding She-Hulk, because if you're in, if you're in the media, you're a woman in the media, being able to tell a story about a physically large woman, it, it, it's a, it's an adrenaline rush. And I, you know, that doesn't excuse mocking, um, mocking a group. Now, in that case, I don't, I completely disagree that they were mocking the quote unquote fans. That was a, a, a really toxic message because mm -hmm. if you look at that, you know, the, the thing they did with the, um, the internet mm -hmm. and all the haters on the internet, the screen names they were using some of them were clearly women they were like fashion blogger names and that was something that got lost in translation between the male fans of hulk stuff or or the she hulk comics that i can get into why i think this went a bit wrong in a bit but you know they weren't talking about the people who heard it it was like an accidental dog whistle yeah can there be an accident there's got to be another term for it 
they were talking, they specifically said trolls in the media. And people flipped it to fans. And there's no, like, no, not all fans are trolls. And if you're seeing trolls and hearing fan, that says something. I mean, we have seen a lot of situations where people say, oh, people criticizing this are just trolls. And it is people who are like, no, I actually like this thing. I just don't like what you've done with it. So it's like, I get that, but I also understand where you're coming from. Where and it's that, like- and that, again, I think people are using two different definitions of the term troll. Mm-hmm. Because to me, a troll, and, and th- this is where I've had a really, I got caught up in this, and this is where I think part of the problem comes from. Mm-hmm. A troll, in in my understanding of it, is not someone who is so upset, so emotionally compromised, they behave badly. Which, let's face it, was 80% of the backlash to She-Hulk. Guys yeah. were just having feelings that they didn't know what to do with. Yeah. They didn't understand. That's not a troll to me. A troll no. is someone... And I, I was a member of the Something Awful Forum. So this is where I get my definition of troll from. <laughs> when you troll, you are emotionally, you don't care. You're just mm-hmm. doing it for the lulls. You're just doing it to screw with people. There is no emotional investment. And so when people say, but, but when a normie says troll, they're they're talking about both groups Mm -hmm. they're not separating and so people are having so many fan fights come down to arguments of definition and it drives me crazy i will like we started off this thing saying how are we defining toxic fandom i guarantee you there will be at least one comment with someone going that's not what toxic fandom means this is what toxic fandom means and I I have that with feminism. I have that with the term MRA. I've seen that like pretty much every term that has a sociopolitical charge is an argument of definition. Mm -hmm. And people, the question of who is centered, is it the people who are behaving well and just, they like things, they don't like things? Well, it's very rarely that. And that's the problem. Yeah. Right? I mean, do I expect... Do I expect Dave Filoni to give a shit that I wasn't thrilled about season three of The Mandalorian? There were certain parts I really liked. There were certain parts I absolutely loved. Overall, it felt messy and kind of out of ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, do, do, Do I think he gives a shit? No. When the numbers start declining, then they will care. Because Hollywood's obsessed with analytics now, and as long as people keep watching there and that's why i gave she hulk more credit than a lot of people because that last monologue where she just went through the laundry list of fan complaints about marvel properties Mm -hmm. and i thought that was the i thought that was one of the greatest examples of listening to the fans of saying we hear you on this i have ever seen and it got lost Mm -hmm. And that's not right. It got lost because people were so upset that they couldn't go, okay, they are showing you guys that they actually are listening to some of the complaints. In fact, what I saw in that writing is people who were actually coming from a very insecure spot. They knew they were going to catch shit. They they knew people were going to scream at them no matter what they did. And if they didn't care, they just would have gone, yeah, whatever, we're going to run our race. You get that insecure response. Kevin Smith does the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. Get that insecure response when somebody wants it to be good and they fear rejection. And I think as I think creators have to find a balance of, okay, I want to make something good, but I also don't care what other people say. And like that, that's, that's not an easy balance. And it's something you do 
deliberately. It's not even just, okay, I've reached the state where I don't care. It's sometimes something's going to come and it will whack you. And then you have to sit with it and go get back into balance well, pretty it, much. It, and, that, and that's where outlining and, and really what is this about and why am I doing this? Because mm-hmm. you, you only get so many provocations before you lose the audience. That is true. Yeah. You know, in my YouTube content, and I, I admit with with the boss fight game, I am really struggling to find the line because it, it we it, it's a comedy. Mm-hmm. And it's a comedy about atypical people. And I'm less worried about, I mean, there are some people who are just going to go, this is a damsel in distress. I don't care. You know, this is a hyper feminine character. She's just bad at sexes. I'm prepared for that. Mm-hmm. The, the stuff that's really psyching me out is the people the people where I am writing about myself and they're going to see them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did not expect so many people to see themselves in Solomon. That was a real wake up call for me. So many men, you know, (laughs) not trans men, men. And that's Mm -hmm. what's so interesting. Solomon's a trans man. Like, and and so many guys is like, oh my God. Yes. And, and it's the, you know, that's why the she thing made so much sense to me. You know, <laughs> Princess Sparkle Muff and I can get in the hat of a Femi fairy tale princess because that is clearly a performance. Mm-hmm. Solomon is getting closer to me. And so I have this constant thing of, because he's supposed to be the guy you love and want to see succeed just because he's been through so much shit and he's so bullied and... That's why that's why it works is Princess Sparkle Muffin doesn't have a bullying bone in her body. Yeah. So he's safe. Right. And I'm trying to explore the role that that fairy tale princess has for men and why why the criticisms of Princess Peach and Zelda and all the all the Femi girls mm-hmm. are off base i think they are wrong but i need to tell a story that shows that i can't have all the action stop for a political speech you know it it reminds me of that scene in tangled where she goes into the snuggly duckling bar (laughs) and it's, it's all these ruffians and thugs and but you know See, I, I get, sorry go ahead i but i guarantee you that name would have gotten flagged today but keep going right. snuggly duckling snuggly duckling yeah yes but you know the it, and i mean it is it is a bit of a misdirection because you know rapunzel being a disney princess she brings out the best in everyone and you get all these guys who you know it's basically the tough biker bar and it's like, oh no, this this guy wants to fall in love, and this guy wants to be a concert pianist, and this one there there was a pretty. It, it, there's the one interior designer where it's like, you that, that okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's very very gay stereotype. Yeah, that that whole movie would have because you know that that um, snuggling is a term pedophiles use on their victims. You know, it's not sexual. It's just snuggling. Mm -hmm. And with the gay coding in that part of the movie and that term, I guarantee you the DeSantis crowd would have flipped their fucking shit today. And that's not what was intended. No. And, And you can't make, because let's face it, when you know you've got an audience, and I, I do think this is part of the reason that creators engage in the toxicity, When you have an audience you know is going to scream at you, it is impossible to create in a pure state. And Mm -hmm. that's what I have to do with, because I love the the social 
references and and one would say social satire or lampoon in games like quest for glory king's quest monkey island you know those pop culture references Mm -hmm. but you can't do them anymore without someone insisting it's political you cannot do something you can't do anything without someone recognizing that just because you base something about a character on a person doesn't mean that that character is that person. You're not making a biopic. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, isn't going back to Alice in Wonderland, isn't the Red Queen even supposed to be a commentary on Queen Victoria? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. They're, they in, in the movie, they combined the Queen of Hearts and the Red Queen. Mm-hmm. And you know they've been trying to figure out how to reseparate that ever since because the (laughs) red queen is with the white queen Mm -hmm. in through the looking glass yeah whereas alice in wonderland it's the queen of hearts it's actually a different it's possibly a different world yes i believe so yeah and so i mean they put the red queen and the white white queen in i believe it was king's quest six and, you know, they made them sort of arguing over dumb things and, and you needed to, it, it, it was quite, it was quite good. It was quite mm-hmm. a good use of classic Alice in Wonderland. But, you know, is combining the Red Queen and the Queen of Hearts a, a mistake in the Disney universe? No, it's just a choice. Mm-hmm. It, you know, they, they combine three characters into Sansa Stark in Game of Thrones. And the difference between the two is the domino effect on Game of Thrones became, it it became horrible things happening to three different women became horrible things happening to a single woman. It was too much for a lot of people to take. I mean, even like with Rob Stark's wife, it's, they changed her fundamentally. And then, you know, his actual wife, I don't remember her name. She's still alive in the books. Yeah. Yeah, and, but they wanted the big shocking. Yeah, but, but and part of it was they realized they had changed her so much that they had to kill her off because they couldn't it would affect yeah. the story too much. Yeah. So. Which you didn't think of that when okay, guys, but but I mean that's the thing. I do you remember the uproar with the uh what's his name? Uh the guy who raped Sansa. Now, okay, mm-hmm. technically not rape in that world yeah that's that that's that's how men are supposed to behave yeah in that world sansa was the one being you know by this and people are gonna get real mad at me for this by the norms of that world sansa is being an entitled brat Mm -hmm. you don't get all the trappings of being the wife of a nobleman and not do the thing you need to do to have children Mm -hmm. and you know she she was really i mean by modern standards well yes the whole thing with Tyrion, he's being and he is being kind to her yeah but she's being and i think the intent was yes sansa is a child because she's supposed to be about 15, I think, at that point in the story. I believe in the book, she's only like 13. But yeah, but they when had to starts. age all the Starks up. Yeah. Well, when it when it starts, she's about 13. But by that point, because the, the timelines in the Game of Thrones books are long and George R. R. Martin was very because you know, it takes them it takes them a month to get from one place to another yeah there, there was also the time. issue that they had to age up all the stark children well, because sure. you could you couldn't get actors that young yeah um like danny is supposed to be 14 when she yeah. marries Khal Drago. the yeah. problem is and i didn't realize this until i actually read the first book that you know the way especially like rob and john behave oh yeah it makes sense when they're 15 yes it does but when you get the older actors doing the same thing i'm they like seem like morons yeah and i'm yeah. like it, it, it's also a lot of people are it, it's like oh well this is the developmentality 
of a 17 or 19 year old. And it's like, but it wasn't back then. No, no. Everyone had to grow up faster. So there was more maturity. But the, you know, the reaction from the feminist circles to the, um, Sansa. Sansa, and what the heck's his name? Oh, Not I can see the, his face. Ramsey. Ramsey Bolton. That's right. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, the fact that people went, no, not Sansa. I was bothered because you're saying Daenerys, that's okay. And who knows how many other women, that's okay. Why not Sansa? Why is she protected? Why is she too good to assault, but these other women aren't? I have questions. And these are so, this, this was the Mary Sue mm-hmm. doing in an allegedly feminist publication. And I made a video on it. You can expect what happened there. And what strikes me about these circles and why I do believe them to be toxic and why I stick with the subject of gender studies, because when, you know, I'm doing male driven content, I'm doing content on men. It's still it's still the study of gender Mm -hmm. is because I actually believe we do need to understand how these things work. I do believe that the. The way we talk about this stuff has become poisoned because instead of that thing i said a while back of there's multiple ways to man right there's multiple ways to woman right Mm -hmm. there's one right answer at a time and this is i mean oh but you're arguing choice feminism yes yes i fucking am because the whole point of equality is that if you don't have equality then you are robbing one section of society of their agency in favor of another section of society. And agency is all about the ability to make choices. So yes, yeah, we, we need to be able to make choices. The minute it's like, oh, you have to do what's good for your gender. You cannot both argue gender is a social construct and toe the party line based and, on. And at some point you and I are gonna have to do a whole thing on choice feminism. Because it, it's something I've been wanting to discuss for a while, but I, it's yeah. a bit much to bring in now. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, we got we to gotta start. Okay, let, let's, let's go back to the, the toxic fandom thing, because mm-hmm. I want to circle back around to that thing you said right off the top, and I think is apt, the, the idea of investment and mm-hmm. why, because I, I don't think we've quite, like you said, go deep instead of broad. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to make sure we go deep on this one because I think I, I do I do think there's something really there because I get invested in things, but I have become very practiced in doing it as a it's not mine. Because mm-hmm. I, you know, I I as you know, I I consult and 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 mentor and advise on a lot of different creative projects, but the end of the day. It's not my book. It's not my show. It's, you know, not my whatever, not my web series, except when it is. (laughs) And so I, it's not about what I want. It's about the story the author is telling. And I think that when people, I want to know, I'm I'm debating dropping a hot take here. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because, you know, I'm not, this is one of these things where I'm trying out. I'm not sure it's right. I'm saying it so it can be tested. Mm -hmm. That it is very healthy to use media to figure out who you are. It is very, very self-destructive to need media to affirm who you are. That does not mean we shouldn't have discussions when people feel attacked by something. Mm-hmm. No, I 
I think you're exactly right because, you know, I already talked about, you know, my feeling with Jessica Rabbit and, you know, someone trying to claim she's asexual and me lashing out. And another example is I will never be totally on board with Zendaya's MJ. I understand it's a different character. I understand different universe. I get that. But that's still not my MJ because MJ in the comics is a character whose background is very similar to mine. And she's had a lot of my same experiences. And so when you take that away, I'm like, but I want my MJ. But at the same time, I acknowledge Zendaya does a great job. I'll just always be a little salty. Well, that's how I felt about the uh, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. It just didn't hit hit for me. No, neither Tobey or Kristen Dunst work for me. Well, they really went, they really went into the white, they, they went from girl next door. They were going for regular girl and they kind of landed on white trash with that MJ. And that's, what's frustrating is because like her father was a college professor. Yeah. Who taught English. I and don't, I like, here's the thing. It's the father they they don't even show him on screen but that situation is fairly accurate to a time in in mj's life where she her mother she and her mother were staying with her one of her uncles who was a steel worker i believe right so like that that does have implications of white trash but also by the time peter and mj met it was she was visiting her aunt who lived next door. So it, right. they, they did the girl next door thing, which she was supposed to be a bit of a subversion. Cause like Aunt yes. May and Aunt yes. Anna kept trying to set them up. And he's like, I, I don't want the girl next door. I've, I've got all these other cool hot girls who yeah. I, I want to hang out with. And yeah. then MJ comes in and he's like, holy shit, that's Mary Jane. Yeah, because you know he kept expecting her to be the plain girl next door. So when you right made her the girl next door, eh. see that this is the problem with a property that existed for in in continuing storytelling for decades yeah. before they adapt. And you know, I there there have been different takes on Mary Jane. Yeah. The thing I, mean, I, I think that's important to realize about Mary Jane is Stan Lee was telling his own story through those characters there. Yeah. And it's like, I, I can separate Ultimates, Ultimate Spider-Man Mary Jane from 616, but still 616 is my favorite. So obviously that's the one I want. And I, but I, did, I, I did like what Home, uh, no, sorry, No Way Home did, at, at least attempting to say all of these are valid. Yeah. And like, I hope I have reached a point of maturity enough where I can say, okay, this helped me find and understand myself, mm-hmm. but I can also take a step back and I don't need to be super defensive that, you know, that's not my MJ. Well, so. I have the same thing with Mara Jade in Star Wars. I am not as stoked about, uh, Z- um, Zon, yeah, yeah, um, in Ahsoka because oh, Thrawn, 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 yeah. Now, the Timothy Zon was the one who created that's Thrawn that's why, and yeah, that's why I got it. And, but that's yeah. the thing, they sort of came as a package deal mm-hmm. in those stories, and it's impossible for me not to have been attached to Mara Jade for obvious reasons. A lot of people don't know she was, um, she, one of her disguises, what is this, one of Palpatine's court dancers. And her mm-hmm. alias was Liana. I did not. Oh, that's right. Yep. Way too I close think, to it. I, I am way she, too close to it. I think she used that name when she was undercover in Jabba's palace. Yep. too. Yep. Um, and so, you know, it, but, and, but Mara you know, Jade, I mean, she, she started off with kind of a heel mm-hmm. and they, the way they drew her, she was, she was more of that. She was more of that Ripley 70s pretty mm-hmm. in that she was allowed to have some edges. Yeah. And I mean, of course, all of this is is catnip. And so they're bringing in Thrawn and everybody's cheering 
And I'm like, you, you guys are so predictable. And, and they, something I something I just realized, and this is actually a bit genius on, on Timothy Zahn's part, is there's a scene in Heir to the Empire where Thrawn and Mara meet up. And yeah. th- he tests her to prove that she is who she says. Yeah. But I just realized the scene proves that they are both who they say they are. Because in the follow-up to Heir to the Empire trilogy they bring in a fake Thrawn to try and reunite yes, yes, to give, right. to create a figurehead for the Imperials to get behind again. Mm-hmm. And I realized that scene doesn't just prove that Mara Jade is who she says she is. It proves that Thrawn is who she's, who yeah. he says he is as yeah. well. And it proves yeah. they were both working for the emperor. They were yeah. both there that night, yeah. which proves their whole story. And that looking back, that was genius on, on Zahn's yeah, part, like I said. I, I am not going to be appeased by Thrawn because now they've made it so we, not only are we never going to get Mara Jade, we can't. Mm-mm. They cut off that character. Like, Luke's dead. Yeah. And it's As- it's clear he never had a wife. Yeah, like, they totally changed the trajectory of that character Mm-hmm. And there is this, there is this Star Wars doesn't understand girls thing mm-hmm. going on right now. Not even the type of, the type of quote unquote strong women. Mm-hmm. And we can't have that discussion because so, so much of it feels now to me like, take it like it shut up. Mm-hmm. We're creating space for you. And, you know, like, as I've said before, and it's kind of funny, I said this to my best friend and now he quotes it all the time, Yeah, is it's like they took away my steak dinner. They gave me gruel mm-hmm. and said, but this was made for you. So you're supposed to like it more. Yeah. And yeah. that's, yeah, that's. <laughs> it's, it, it's like when, for me, I have a similar analogy. Mm-hmm. It's more that they hear you're a vegetarian and so they give you pasta primavera with without adequate protein sources Mm -hmm. i'm so sick of like the carb overloads when you order a vegetarian meal at an event mm -hmm. and these 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 characters that they're i'm trying to be real careful about using but they just feel like empty carbs yeah and like, look, when we did our, our discussion on authentic female characters, yeah. Mara Jade did not make the list. And there was a reason for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. She was so not. She was she was that. I mean, even. I think I think Leia, as written, was more of an idealized woman. It was Carrie Fisher's portrayal mm-hmm. that. I mean, that very much was the ideal woman of the 1970s. It, it among among thinking men like Hollywood, uh, bleh, Star Wars was sort of straddling the line between curvo science fiction and new Hollywood cinema. Mm-hmm. And they were definitely trying for that 70s feminism with leia Mm -hmm. and and it's it's hard to it it's hard to use it's hard to get the right term for what was going on there because there were two sort of there was like the barbarella type sci-fi which is more of a 40s throwback yeah and then there was this new what was called new hollywood cinema which is which was entertainment fair for a generation of college educated men that was a new phenomenon in that period of time the Hayes code was starting to fall away at that point yeah too, wasn't it was it? yeah 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 so you could get away with more yeah but they were definitely trying to make leia they were doing a taming of the shrew thing with her and han mm-hmm. and if she had been a doe-eyed you know uh, if she had not been that 70s era feminist, it wouldn't have worked. 
it, it was the same way sort of Margot Kidder in the 79 Superman movie that that was not people think that that was the typical woman of mm -mm. the time it it wasn't that was the the second wave feminist ideal of a woman and like she she's a hot mess done right mm -hmm. i think the stuff they did with superman and lois this season was gut-wrenching it, it's taking me a long time to get through because it's so legitimately painful but it's it they are actually showing how lois who is very much a control freak they've shown that she's a control freak with her kids and everything else and and that makes sense it's a flaw but it's not overdone mm -hmm. and clark normally just sort of goes along with it and talks to kids later it doesn't undermine her but they're a good team because he's yeah. a little too permissive which i think is an interesting character point of superman as a dad makes sense but now he has to get tough with her and she has to let people help and it is it is agonizing it, it's it's tough to watch and it's good it's a new fucking idea in super superhero storytelling and it, it, we need those mm -hmm. and there's you know that's an example of a show where it's doing a it's doing a ton of things right i mean it even used steel sorry he's john henry irons now they don't call him that anymore but they even use him instead of instead of a race swap Jimmy Olsen, mm -hmm. which is allegedly what people ask for. And you do not see people championing this show. And it's odd to me why they want to fight the stuff they don't like. They don't want to praise the stuff that's done well. To me, that's the definition of toxic. Oh, absolutely. It's that. It's that thing where they want something or they say they want something. And that's, that's part of it is, you know, when you try to appease the vocal minority and like there, there's a comic online where it's, I don't like this thing. Okay. I changed that thing. You right. don't like, well, yeah. the people who liked it before, we don't like it anymore. Sorry. We're not going to buy it. Right. And then, well, I changed it for you. Are you going to buy it? No, I just didn't like what you had. Yeah. And it's well, part part of a big lever is the aggrievement. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, creators don't recognize that aggrievement, feeling wronged, feeling that there's this professional victimhood that's getting passed back and forth mm -hmm. where one side sees the other side getting attention for the howling. And so they think that the way to get what they want is to howl. And they don't, they don't seem to realize attention does not, does not indicate effectiveness. And people no. fight me. I have evidence now, you know, because people were saying that, oh, there's this, you know, trans powerful group of trans and lgbtq plus activists in these spaces they have all the power important people listen to them well that argument doesn't work anymore because of all the legislation that has been successfully passed against gay and trans people not not rights from the government just talking about their lives in mm -hmm. certain but like like pulling books out of libraries that's not curriculum that's that's banning books if if they're so powerful th that wouldn't happen that isn't a grassroots group rising and up that is power structure saying we're gonna stomp on you to try to be the second place for when trump gets convicted and can't run anymore <laughs>